So ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to the IMPACT panel, Hydrogen in Europe, Go Large or Decentralized. If this is the first time we're meeting each other, my name is Molly Huang, Content Lead of Leader Associates and your host of today's session. Before we get everything started, please allow me just one minute to briefly introduce who we are at Leader Associates and what we do on a daily basis. Leader Associates is an international clean energy event organizer committed to renewables and sustainable energy transition. We focus on solar, wind, energy storage, and green hydrogen. In terms of global hydrogen series, in 2022, we have five physical events in total, from connecting green hydrogen MENA in Dubai in March, to connecting green hydrogen Europe in Madrid in July, from Apex Australia, to Asia's regional center, Singapore and Japan. In our European gathering in Madrid this year, the Connecting Green Hydrogen Europe is also co-located with our Wind Asset Management Europe and Solar Energy Future Europe 2022 to main electricity sources to produce green hydrogen. By doing that, we create a unique green ecosystem where project developers can meet with credible partners. And that's everything about us. In the following one hour, we will move on to a very intense panel discussion on the future shape of hydrogen development in Europe, joined by NG, SNAM, Arsiona, Hydrogen Valley, LIFE, and moderated by the global leading investment in the finance vehicle, Macquarie. For the audience, you are free to raise with questions in the Q&A box. Please highlight which speaker you'd like to direct to and we will open the floor and respond at the end of the conversation. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome on stage Mr. Dario Trump, head of the Climate Intelligence Unit of Macquarie and our moderator of the panel today. Dario, please turn on your mic and video and please welcome your dear panel colleagues on stage. The floor is now yours. Thank you for um, this introduction, Molly. That's very kind of you. Um, I think we, we can um, kickstart uh, immediately with a, with a little round table to introduce um, our different speakers because we have quite a, a wide set of, of expertise and, and perspectives um, here. So I'll do it in the order they uh, appear on, on my Zoom. Belen, if you would start by um, introducing yourself and, and how your company is getting involved in, in hydrogen. Of course, good morning and thank you for the invitation to, to me and to ACCIONA to this, to this panel and thank you also to my colleagues for, for this, this attendance. Uh, my name is Belen Linares, I am the uh, Global Innovation Director in ACCIONA Energy. ACCIONA Energy is one of the largest 100% uh, green utilities operating worldwide more than 13 gigawatts uh, based on several technologies based on wind, solar PV, floating solar PV, CSP, biomass, hydraulics, energy storage, and now a green hydrogen a technology. A, we have assets all over the world, a, North and South America, a, Europe, of course, South Africa, India, and, and Australia. Uh, our, our mission is to commercialize the green electricity and now the green hydrogen in order to promote and lead the energy, the energy transition technology, uh, technologies transformation uh, into the business. We are really excited with the fact of uh, being able to, to transform, the, to pilot the different new technologies that are uh, leading the energy transition and trying to develop uh, a real commercialization pipeline for these technologies, the green hydrogen, for example, and transforming that into real business. In the different markets, well, we all have already have customers, we already have business, and trying also to, to get the different a business models that we really believe are interesting for these new technologies. For the green hydrogen, we will discuss later on, but we, we are really piloting several projects worldwide, one in Europe and one in America, uh, trying to promote 
the, 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 this technology and trying to demonstrate that there is a real potential, uh, potential uh, transformation of these technologies for the decarbonization of the planet. Thank you. Uh, if I could move to DJ, you're next. Hello, good morning or good afternoon to all and thank you for inviting me. I'm Didier Holo, I'm Executive Vice President in Engie. Engie is a large energy group uh, specialized more or less in renewable, be it electrical renewable, be it uh, gas, like uh, biomethane, like uh, green hydrogen, or be it renewable heat, like uh, district heating and cooling, geothermal, and so on. And we, uh, on top of this renewable, we have a very large share of our activity in um, establishing energy solution for our customers, so working on the customer side to help them solve their energy problems. Thank you very much, Didier. Um, if I could go to Soren next. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Søren. I'm the CEO of uh, Hydrogen Valley in Denmark. Um, Hydrogen Valley is, uh, is, is sort of like a, 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 an entity connecting the dots in, um, uh, in, in hydrogen, where we connect production and, um, and, and usage. Uh, we have been involved in one of the first megawatt scale uh, electrolysis units in, uh, in Denmark. And um, and are continuing to uh, to connecting the dots uh, in um, in this uh, in this hydrogen world. And a lot has happened uh, over the over the last couple of years. Uh, our hydrogen valley was formed in two thousand and seven, and back then uh, that was a really different world. Uh, so I'm really excited to see the attention hydrogen is getting uh, getting today because back then there was a there was something that happened uh, in, the, in the research hallways, and that's not the case anymore. It's, it's really scaling up right now. Thanks. So that, uh, sorry, I, I think we're all quite excited about that. So great, great to share the enthusiasm. Uh, Cosma, if we could get a short introduction from you. Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm Cosma Panzaki, leading the hydrogen business unit at SNAM. Uh, as you know, SNAM is the largest uh, uh, energy infrastructure operator in Europe. We have a, a large scale program to convert our pipelines to transport hydrogen in large quantities. And we just disclosed before the end of the year that also our underground storage uh, can be reconverted to um, store hydrogen in large quantities. On top of that, uh, SNAM has been working on two other areas, uh, technologies for hydrogen, and we have taken a stake in Denora, the largest uh, producer of electrodes in Europe and uh, a partner of UCIRA, and ITM Power, the leader in uh, PEMA electrolyzers. Finally, we have been working in a number of applications downstream. So uh, we are working with FNM, for example, in mobility and trains. Uh, and won an innovation fund grant from the European Union on that. And we have been working with our club eight uh, players in steel, glass, uh, uh, plastics, uh, and paper. So very happy to be here. Thank you very much. And to close us off, uh, Luc, if you could introduce yourself. Yes, hi, my name is Luc Rade. I'm taking care of the international expansion at LIFE. Uh, I joined uh, LIFE after having served in uh, higher management positions at REC the Norwegian solar panel maker and Nell Hydrogen, worldwide the largest electrolyzer manufacturer. I joined in uh, July 2020, uh, a team of 15 people at LIFE. Then we started uh, a massive uh, recruitment uh, program where today we are with more than 90 people and we are planning to double again the headcount by more than, uh, than that actually than, uh, by the year end. Um, what we are, we are a producer of green hydrogen, which means uh, we build plants uh, to produce green hydrogen, uh, we operate them and we sell the hydrogen to different uh, off-takers, which could be an industry, steel, glass companies, but also mobility. We have opened uh, last year in, in August our first plant, which was in France, uh, where we were the first in the world to connect directly to four wind turbines and also to use uh, the seawater as a feed water for the electrolyzer. So that was an electrolyzer at a certain scale. It was not in a small lab, it was really industrial scale. And, and I think we were the first one in the world. We will be also the first one in the world um, to start uh, producing hydrogen as a pilot on the sea. 
So we are very strong also believing in, in offshore uh, hydrogen production. And uh, in the Atlantic Ocean uh, near France, uh, we will be in September this year doing this with the modern megawatt electrolyzer directly connected to a wind turbine, which is already at that location. And the plan is really by 25 to have a network of uh, hydrogen plants uh, in the major countries uh, in Europe and that we are able to deliver reasonable quantities of green hydrogen to our customers and the later on uh, the years to come down to further scale up mainly from offshore production. Thanks a lot, um, Luc. So as you've seen, we, we really have a nice uh, wide set of perspectives from, from pure players to you know, historic uh, utilities and, and, and companies working across the, the ecosystem. Uh, I thought to, to kick us off because you know, hydrogen obviously is a gas that nicely connects um, some of our um, you know, activity in the clean electricity production, but also in, in Europe, I think there's, there's a big interest around how the gas infrastructure could eventually uh, play a role in, in distributing hydrogen. So I wanted to start with maybe our historic players in, in the gas sector who are increasingly seeing the electricity transition uh, with, with Didier and Cosma. Maybe Didier first, so, you know, NG historically a, a gas player now, a lot of clean electricity. How does hydrogen now fit into your, your strategy and, and where do you see the, the near-term outlook for, for Europe in this space? Well, um, it has been a long time since we gave up sinking in energy in silos, power on one side and gas and uh, heating and uh, district, district heating and cooling uh, on the other side. So what our customers want is energy. They don't care about electricity, gas or whatever. They want a certain format of energy at the place where they need it. And in order to do that, we have decided to supply them with energy without CO2, and we work with them to find the best possible solution. And all studies today show that globally for any country, it is less expensive and more resilient to have an energy system relying on several vectors, power on one side, green gases, uh, district heating and cooling and, and, and some other uh, forms like geothermal and so on, uh, rather than putting all your eggs in the same basket. And therefore, for us, green gases are absolutely complementary to uh, green power. And uh, between uh, green gases, we really think that the biggest share in the long-term picture by 2045, 2050, will be taken by biomethane on one side, possibly some syngas, either from waste or from, uh, from uh, hydrogen and CO2, and on the other side by hydrogen without CO2, and that means for us mostly green hydrogen, but we do not exclude turquoise, that's a pyrolysis of methane. We do not exclude natural hydrogen, what we call white hydrogen. We do not exclude hydrogen from biomass. Also, these are possibilities that we, we also consider. So that's the bulk of what will be green gas in 2050. On top of that, depending on the countries and the resources available, you may need some uh, green or blue gas that's gas done with CCS. That may be natural gas plus CCS, that may be blue hydrogen, which involves CCS, if you don't have enough green or without CO2 solution. But for us, it's only a complement, depending on the country, and wherever you can, you will do only without CO2 if you can. Thanks, Dr. Didier. And, and maybe if I could follow up with Cosma, um, SNAM has probably been one of the most uh, bullish um, gas network operators in terms of, of greening uh, its grid. I think with a fully decarbonized gases by, by 2050 as a long-term goal, but uh, some, some very concrete near-term targets. And, and you just mentioned, you know, hydrogen retro compatibility is, is very much um, uh, doable and on the agenda. Could you tell us a bit more about, about that? Because I think that that's really a key 
to unlocking the, the vision of uh, Europe and, and, and hydrogen is whether or not networks are, are ready to be converted rapidly to, to higher shares of hydrogen. Well, uh, thanks for the question, because I think it's a very uh, hot topic to determine how the European system can be or cannot be resilient. Um, uh, let me take a step back here and say that what SNAM is doing is not done by SNAM only, but there's a, uh, a system of, uh, of TSOs that are working together on this. And so uh, we have published with other 20 plus TSOs the hydrogen backbone work. We are working with H2GAR with the top 10 uh, TSOs in Europe actually to exactly define standards and carry out analysis to make sure that our grids are as soon as possible ready to transport large quantities of hydrogen. What we are concretely doing uh, in, uh, in Italy on our own infrastructure is basically three things. Well, first of all, on the pipelines per se, we have carried out extensive analysis on the metallurgy of the pipelines, and we have involved in this also a third party to certify uh, the, the safety and certify the uh, uh, easy adaptation of our infrastructure. Uh, the third party is RINA. Uh, you, you, might be, uh, you might know DMV in an international context. Uh, it is basically a, a very similar institution to that. Uh, they're carrying out the certification, they will complete it in, uh, in the next few months, but we are already in a position where we can say that 70% plus of our networks are already ready to transport up to 100% hydrogen. That's point number one. Point number two, uh, which has been even more complex, has been on, uh, on storage. So Italy is not blessed with uh, uh, salt caverns, but we have depleted gas fields as storage uh, infrastructure. Uh, at the same time, uh, the storage in Italy is uh, uh, an important resource for, for Europe because together with uh, uh, Germany and France, we of course are at the core in terms of size of the, of the storage in Europe. And uh, uh, we have carried out uh, extensive analysis with a consortium of universities, including the Italian Polytechnics, the IIT, uh, and also international experts to verify whether our storage can be converted. And apart from one, a couple of final tests from a battery logical point of view, we are in a position to say that, yes, our storage can be also easily reconverted. So that's the second part of saying, are we ready for the hydrogen uh, you know, uh, transition? The third part uh, regards all the technologies that are around, uh, if you want, storage, pipelines, and the final users. So this includes uh, compressors, this includes membranes, this includes valves, this includes also measuring, measuring systems. And uh, uh, I have to say that on this, we are working hand in hand with uh, uh, large technological groups and uh, also with startups in some cases uh, on the different parts of, of the equation. I think the most challenging uh, area, which we are also working with SoCal Gas in the United States on, is uh, uh, the utilization of membranes uh, because it's a crucial element to make blending feasible uh, over the short term but it's also potentially extremely expensive as of today so we have to find a solution that is uh, technologically safe but also economically viable i think that that was a really uh, good point to close on uh, it, it seems that their technological viability is is, is increasingly clear and, and and positive but then obviously the economics uh, play a role in, in bringing that to maturity. Um, I wanted to bring us a bit closer to um, today's hydrogen uh, activity with, uh, with Belen and, and Luc. Uh, Belen, in particular, you, you've commissioned last year um, the first project in Mallorca, planning to, to ship to customers, I think pretty much now, if, if not already. Could you tell us a bit more about you know, what you learned from this project? It's, it's on an island that makes it quite interesting. And, how do you think you, you, you'll build on that for, in your strategy in other places? Of course. I, I first agree with Didier that the, our customers, they, they are requiring for energy, not only electricity, for their electrical needs and for their thermal needs. So the, the, the interest of piloting a so pioneer project, investing in advance that the demand is uh, generated and in a high zone, it was to show 
that uh, the high line is a, an Iceland is a, a really interesting ecosystem in which generating all the different business models where the green hydrogen can have uh, an economical feasibility in the short term. So we've been piloting this project uh, three years ago and we've been commissioning this project by, by December the last year. Uh, we are generating solutions in the Iceland for the decarbonization and the energetic independence of the Iceland versus the, the, the peninsula, Spain. Uh, we were trying to, to show the high versatility of, of, of the green hydrogen as an energy vector. So we are trying to demonstrate different business applications of the green hydrogen. We are not centered in a single a customer for this project, but we are trying to replicate different kind of uses of the, of the green hydrogen as if Mallorca uh, becomes a green hydrogen ecosystem showing the real capability of this technology to become a business. We are also aimed to use the green hydrogen as energy storage in different applications for the future. And uh, we are uh, testing the viability of incorporating the green hydrogen as an injection in the current Balearic gas network. So this is really interesting for us also as one of the interesting business models for the green hydrogen applicability is the guarantees of origin a commercialization of the green hydrogen versus the natural gas initially as it was said by my colleagues in a blending in a blending scheme so mallorca a project is a, is a strategic a project that is promoting the construction of this green hydrogen generation plant. And it was initially supported by the Spanish government and the Balearic regional government, of course, in, and is developed by two big um, partners, Enagas, uh, that is the, the gas uh, company in Spain, and Acciona Energy. We have also the support from the Spanish government, from IDAE, and also as a partner, Femex, that is the, the, the owner of the, of the terrains where we are installing the solar plants and the green hydrogen plant. The aim of the project is the reindustrialization of an existing a concrete plant in Mallorca. Uh, we have also generated a European consortium to ask for a European Commission funding. And we finally got in December 2020, uh, the final uh, agreement with the European Commission that is supporting the project with 10 million euros uh, funding. Uh, this is a 30 uh, euros million uh, investment project that is basically a, a 2.5 megawatt electrolyzer that is fed by two solar, a, two 15 megawatt solar plants, one in self-consumption scheme and another in a guarantees of origin a scheme. So not in self-consumption because we would want to replicate the two ways of feeding an electrolyzer. A, it is generating 13 tons a, per, per year of green hydrogen. It is uh, avoiding CO2 emission by 16,000 tons. It has been granted, as I've said, by the European Commission, and it started the operation uh, phase by the end of 2021. The, the renewable hydrogen is used for several cases, as I've said. It is supplying clean er energy to several sectors of the Highland. It is generating the fuel supply to fleets of buses and also the fuel, the, the, the supply for fuel cell rental car vehicles in the Highland that you know that basically on the seasonal, uh, more touristic phases in, in Mallorca, it is a real important economical a tractor in the in the Highland. It is also generating green hydrogen for heat and power generation for commercial and public buildings. So a set of several um, fuel cells are installed in all the Highland for generating this uh, business model. And it is also generating green hydrogen for the auxiliary power supply to ferries and port operations. So we are we are trying to to find and to 
incentivate the demand in, in the Balearic Island. The first customer that has been during 2021 signing a contract with, with us is uh, a very important hotel chain in the Balearic Island, Iberostar. They've been contracting us for the first supply by natural gas injection net, the one of, of Baleares, uh, for the thermal needs and uh, much more other hotel also uh, companies in the Highland are interested to get the carbonization proposals uh, substituting the natural gas that they are currently consuming. So it is an exciting project that has started the operation so, so it is just uh, so amazing to be able now in those kind of panels to say, as it was said by my colleagues, that projects are already running. So this is important. Commercial projects are already running. I remember one year ago in those kind of panels, we were saying that we were going to do things. And now we are really uh, telling real applications of, of, of that, uh, of that uh, technology. We really believe in Acciona Energy that, that the, the green hydrogen is an, uh, a key player in the in the energy transition and this is why these kind of projects piloting investing not without risk on these uh, projects will will convert us in early adopters of this technology and tracking for these business models and we really believe that is the key for this uh, decarbonization and, and and investing in in the planet thank you uh, and so i think on that uh, you know decentralized perspective and, and the experience you've shared on looking for for, for customers look you know you, you don't, you're not working just on an island you're, you're trying to find customers uh, all over and, and very much for now I guess in a decentralized way because you don't have access to big energy projects or, or, or sites can you tell us a bit more about that strategy and that vision and how you think it you know differentiates itself from maybe some of, of what the uh, bigger legacy players are trying to do in this space yeah okay thank you thank you for the question uh, indeed i think talking about legacy i think that's the first point we don't have any kind of legacy to carry with us so we can start from the blank piece of paper we don't have any kind of assets running on fossils where we have to find a good balance between the newer systems which we need to, to put in place so we can forget that all one uh, the other thing is also that we have our own team of engineers um, which uh, can do a full uh, design of a plant. We are not uh, depending on the capabilities of the electrolyzer manufacturer to deliver to us a complete plant, including all compressors, etc. We can do this design by ourselves and take also all the liabilities. That gives us a competitive advantage in order to, to, to make indeed that what I explained, this network of decentralized plants where plants could have a size starting from five megawatt, but going up to 100 megawatt also, because we have uh, some on-site productions also, which go to, to 100 megawatt. And, 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 and to, to, to build these up, actually, then. And, and, and that is what we believe can be realized in the short term, I would say the next couple of years. So by 25, we will be able to deliver this. So we're not announcing what is all for great possible by 2030 or beyond. That is not that interesting for the time being done. Of course, we need to, to, to follow the roadmap and we, we have, need to have a vision, et cetera. Then. But we need to find a way how we can serve customers in the industry, in the steel and glass already today by delivering hydrogen as a process gas. So it is not, uh, let us say, going into the heating process and, and replacing all the natural gas by hydrogen. No, it's really as a process gas. And that is important step for them actually then, because they need to test also what the impact is on their product, glass or steel, by going from an, an older process to the new process using hydrogen. And that is an opportunity which we give to them by rolling out now very quickly uh, a network of decentralized uh, plants in, in, in France, in the Benelux countries, in, in Germany, in, um, in, in the Nordic countries, and also very soon we are setting up the operation now in Spain and uh, in Italy. And then of course the question is what is the picture done behind them, 25, 26 and whatever done, 
That is indeed what we believe in the offshore production than actually done where we are going to produce on a big scale offshore hydrogen. And that is also where we believe then that, 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 that the network, what, what uh, Cosma was referring to, will be ready actually then, that we can feed in then uh, onshore coming with the hydrogen then the net in the network then, and in this way serve our customers with big volumes of, of hydrogen. And, and the thing is that they say on the sea also, there we try to use as much as possible existing infrastructure. And the existing infrastructure is the gas pipe network, which is there. You'll be amazed to, to, to find out how many pipe network is on the North Sea, which has been abandoned, which is still lying on the bottom of the North Sea. The platform has been taken away, etc. These infrastructure can be repurposed actually then. And again, that's a big advantage versus cable because in many cases, let us say, it is not possible anymore to, to, to bring new cables and new cables ongoing from somewhere the North Sea uh, to the shore, actually then. And, 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 and that is a vision where we say, starting with decentralized and then going to big scale. Thanks a lot. And, and maybe, Soren, can you um, react to that? You, you, you've mentioned that you've been looking at the, the different um, efforts in, in the space in Denmark for some time. Now we, we try to sort of focus on the most valuable hydrogen projects also because the this transition is accelerating and, and we're seeing that it has some some costs and, and challenges. Um, what, what's your view on, on this question, decentralized versus centralized and, and some of the more interesting applications that are starting to maybe you know stand out versus the others in, in the Danish context? Yes, thank you for that question. <clears throat> what what we have seen during the last 10 years is, is, is what I would call straight line projects where you have wind going into hydrogen production, then going to an end user. Um, if we want, uh, and, and I said, uh, and I heard that, that Cosmo said that, that Italy is not blessed with, uh, with, uh, with salt caverns, uh, we are in Denmark. And one of the, one of the things we have uh, as well in Denmark is that even in a fully electrified perspective from Denmark, we can produce three times as much wind electricity offshore than we have the need for. So we have really a lot of wind electricity. We have salt caverns for storage, but we will never get to use these things if this is not a connected system. Uh, so, so what I think when we're talking about centralized or decentralized production, I think we need to have decentralized production uh, we need to have a lot of uh, hydrogen production, and then it needs to be uh, it needs to be connected via uh, via pipelines. If we want the full perspective, what I would call the second half of the green transition in, within hydrogen, we would definitely need uh, need these uh, these pipelines to transport uh, the, the the hydrogen around. I, would, I could just say in uh, in Denmark, one of the things that we're really discussing right now is the fact that if we have these, I think it's uh, four or five one gigawatt uh, electrolysis uh, projects that has been announced over the last couple of years. Well, if you if you have these uh, projects, then you will need to throw away all the excess heat because even though we have district heating in Denmark, we would need to throw away uh, every, uh, or be, it's producing almost 20 times as much heat that is needed in that area. So we need a lot of what Luke is also, uh, and I know Luke is also, uh, and LIFE is also active in, in some of the 100 megawatt scale projects. So, so that's really what I see in Denmark, at least, because we have the district heating network, we have the cabins, we have a lot of wind electricity, but we need, the first priority is to have a lot of 100 megawatt electrolysis uh, projects rather than uh, a few uh, one gigawatt because of the uh, value streams in, in oxygen and the value streams in, uh, in, in the heat. That's for now really um, really uh, the most important uh, thing to make sure that you use everything because that's the only way the business case can uh, can come together. And then in the future, when you have uh, even cheaper electrolysis uh, units and the price is going down, then you can begin to, uh, to, to look towards, for example, uh, uh, five gigawatt uh, offshore uh, electrolysis production. But for me, that's, that's from uh, 2030 and, and beyond. Thanks. So, and I think that you, you touched on, you know, how to make projects um, economic. I think one of our 
uh, um, someone in the audience, you know, also, also mentioned a lot of the the, the success story of, of selling hydrogen uh, at scale is going to be dependent on being able to access a lot of uh, clean electricity, and we know clean electricity is high in demand in, in other uh, sectors too. And, and we're in a context right now in Europe where certainly there's a lot of, of tension uh, around um, energy supply. I, I was wondering if I could throw an open question to, to the panel a little bit around this. Uh, how to make projects economical? Um, is it more a demand side factor, finding your anchor customer uh, and things like that? Or uh, on the supply side, is a centralized model, for example, one way to access larger, lower cost volumes of, of electricity? Is, is there a tension between these two approaches from an economic perspective? And whoever wants to go first, please uh, pick it up. Uh, maybe I can take, uh, I can start there and leave the floor to. To the team. Uh, look, uh, I, I think we heard also the other panelists talking about, you know, uh, a staggered approach and a multi-phase approach uh, in order to reach uh, full econ economic uh, viability of, uh, of green hydrogen. And uh, it, it is very clear that if you want to make uh, uh, projects uh, economically viable, you need to work on scale of the installation because that will bring the cost down in terms of uh, uh, you know, the electrolyzers and the balance of plants. Just to give you an idea, if you go beyond uh, today, beyond 50 megawatts in terms of, uh, of size of a project, you might have uh, economies of scale in the order of 30 to 40 percent compared to what you would achieve below that threshold. But of course, there's also uh, uh, another, uh, another element, which is the optimization on logistics, right? Because if you produce uh, on, uh, on a limited scale, and then, for example, you have to ship out hydrogen using uh, uh, hydrogen trucks, right? Then the costs can be up to 10 times higher than the cost that you would uh, spend for transporting the same amount through pipelines, for example. So that's the, the second part. The third point, I think it's also a matter of uh, uh, not technology, not size, but it's a matter of uh, finding the right uh, uh, regulatory uh, agreements to make sure that there is a, a liquid market because if there is a liquid market then you know cross-country large-scale projects can thrive otherwise we will have uh, issues on this side and we will leave it, limit the potential for bringing the cost curve down quickly i'll stop here thanks anyone else on this point Belen? Yes, Dario, I would want to add um, from the centralized and decentralized projects or applications, we saw in Spain that the initial uh, demand activation for the green hydrogen was coming for the decentralized self-consumption projects from customers, from energy re requirement uh, and energy customers that they, they really needed on-site a cheap solutions for trying to decarbonize themselves or because they had the, the, the vision to, to do that or because they really had some financial pressure from their investors or, or just the invitation from their investors to, to do that. So these kind of decentralized solutions that are not larger than 10 megawatts uh, on site uh, has been um, activating the sense of urgency of trying to uh, make an aggregation of regional hydrogen valleys more centralized that can be feeding several kind of industries that are close to the same uh, to the same place those hydrogen valleys that are more centralized they are higher larger than 50 megawatts and they can be considered as the single feed for clean energy for green hydrogen to several industries that are located in 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 a similar zone it could be the the the, the example for instance of the ceramic industry on the mediterranean coast of spain or also in portugal there are some specific zones that had some kind of industries that are close to the same uh, zone as Cosme was saying, the, the intention is to try to minimize the impact of the distribution costs for the green hydrogen as the technology uh, for generation is, in my opinion, going faster 
than the technology of distribution. So if we need to add three, four euros per kilo, and this is what we are piloting in Mallorca because of um, distributing by, by pressurized cylinders, in 200 kilometers, the, the green hydrogen, or we are adding extra cost because of uh, generating or changing the way of transporting the green hydrogen through gas to a different uh, solid or liquid support. I mean, this is not helping the business case acceleration. So it makes sense that the initial uh, business models are carried by the decentralized. Uh, models to have uh, the green electricity and the green hydrogen close to the demand in order to avoid or to to avoid these extra costs. But this is true that we really believe that the scale effect is necessary in order, as my colleagues have said, in order to decrease the, on the first hand, to incentivate the increase or the scale up of the electrolyzer size in order to decrease the electrolyzer costs. And this is something similar as we saw in the solar PV sector in the past, or if that we saw for the batteries, for the ion lithium batteries. So this scale effect is going probably to migrate in our, in our opinion, the decentralized models to a more centralized models once the distribution technology is decreasing the cost. So in a, as a conclusion, we believe that both models are going to coexist. Uh, probably the decentralized uh, scheme is going to start earlier in terms of economical feasibility, and we need to be prepared for approaching both. The natural gas uh, net network, uh, the green hydrogen injection in the natural gas is going to help anyway, because it, it is today the more immediate way to, to, to distribute from the, from the cheapest perspective. Thank you. Sorry, and then, and maybe, maybe Dario to, to, to add on this. So I think uh, I do agree with, with Belen and, and Cosma said uh, we support this. I think, but of course, uh, by far the most important driver of the kilogram green hydrogen is the price of electricity. That counts for 75% uh, of, of the cost. Uh, of course, uh, the electrolyzer scale is, is counting for maybe 30, 40% cost down indeed, but it is a portion of, of at the end of the day, the kilogram price as such also the, the logistic aspect. And of course, uh, the price of the green hydrogen is not uh, playing today in our advantage. But of course, that is also probably a temporary effect. Huh? We, we, we talk here about a, a number of plants, in our case, getting operational the next couple of years. That might be a little bit tricky on the electricity cost. But let us say, if you make a business plan for 15 years, that will come to stabilize again the years to come. And what is happening after 25, 26, if you see a forecast of electricity price, it looks like it's going to stabilize again. So, but I think it's not ignored today, the cost of uh, the renewable energy. Thank you. So, Randy wanted to jump in. Uh, yes, please. Uh, oh. Just to um, just 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 to make sure, uh, uh, I, I totally agree agree with uh, agree with you, Kieran. And then, uh, and when we have uh, these uh, economical feasibility issues that we need. Large amounts of of, of low uh, of low price electricity. Um, then we need to find the markets where someone is willing to pay a little bit more. And then in Denmark, at least, uh, and I think that's going uh, really international right now. We see one of the largest shipping companies uh, in heavy, in heavy transportation, Maersk, uh, ordering uh, nine vessels that can run on uh, on methanol. Uh, so so we're really starting to see a, a market for green methanol uh, and, and green methanol production and and for me that is um, that is really one of the markets that uh, that i see uh, going forward um, as, as, as one of the greater markets um, because we have the price estimates of green methanol uh, we can really compete with that when we use uh, when we use uh, green uh, green hydrogen for that compared to how how cheap you can you can make uh, uh, black methanol uh, today? Uh, so, so I, I really believe it. It's it's all about seeing some of the markets. Uh, also, green ammonia 
uh, is is one of the one of the next markets that is that is going to come because the differentiation differentiation in, in in price is not that big between green ammonia and black ammonia. Uh, so so, but it is in when you when you when you look at green hydrogen, that's really a, a, a large uh, price differential right now. So I think using some of the hydrogen carriers like methanol, like ammonia, uh, that's going to scale up uh, hydrogen production at least in Denmark. Thank you. And Didier, you wanted to, to come in and, and just maybe if we could build on Soren's point on, on the demand side, I think uh, quite a few uh, people in the audience have asked, you know, whether policy incentives are needed to stimulate um, demand because there is still a, a price differentiator between uh, green hydrogen and, 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 and regular fossil fuel hydrogen or, or just processes that aren't relying on hydrogen yet. Uh, so, so we've talked a lot about, you know, the competitiveness on, on the cost side and on the delivery side. But I wonder, do you agree with Soren that on the demand side, there's already quite a few applications where customers, anchor customers are ready to make the jump regardless of the policy environment because maybe they have sustainability targets or, or, or it's just an attractive proposition or do we still need to build quite an extensive policy framework uh, across uh, to, to stimulate that demand? Uh, well, our experience. Uh, sorry, I went to DJ was. Oh, sorry, go go ahead. Yeah, my bad, my bad. Okay. Um, well, in order to combine scale and speed, we are looking in NG uh, at encore customers that are customers who have relatively big needs and we who are ready to start with possibly only a share of their needs for hydrogen being green hydrogen. Um, and we have announced agreements with a fertilizer company, with explosives company. We are working very hard today on e-fuels and um, maybe there will be a market for in shipping. I believe the first market will be aviation because aviation, if you see the new project for a directive um, on, um, on fuels in the EU, will have to incorporate synthetic fuels. So we look for this anchor customer in order to reach the 50 megawatts or more than COSMA was alluding to and reach a significant scale. Still, in many cases, you have a competitivity gap and most of the customer will require some form of subsidy or guarantee that they will be able to bridge this gap because um, they know that their own customer are ready to pay something for green fertilizer or for green this and that, but the difference may be a bit big. So in many cases, you still need some uh, public support in order to make, uh, to bridge that, that gap. A second way we have to bridge that gap is that once you have your anchor customer, you know you can start with tens of megawatt. Then you look for other customer around. Uh, a lot of them will be around mobility. Some of them will be smaller user of hydrogen to whom you can provide hydrogen at a better marginal cost because you have this big plant, uh, which is central. And once you have done that, then obviously the, the uh, trend is to interconnect these different hubs because then you will provide storage. You will provide natural support by one to the other if uh, supply is defaulting here and there. And therefore we, we strongly believe that this um, kind of uh, large customers hubs will interconnect. On the other end, they will be still completely decentralized operation. Let me take two examples. One is mining site in the middle of a desert. We have uh, made agreement in uh, South Africa, in Australia, uh, in uh, Chile, sorry, with companies who are operating a mining site in the middle of the desert. They need energy. Diesel is very expensive because it has to be transported there by trucks over hundreds of kilometers. So um, hydrogen may be a competitive solution, uh, particularly in the desert, you can put solar panels there and electrolyzer and, and uh, that's a good business model. But this will be re remain isolated because just geographically it's in the middle of nowhere. 
Uh, another example is in a country like France, only half of the railways will ever be electrified because on the other half, the cost of electrification by catenaries is too expensive. So here, if you find a railway station, which is a kind of regional hub, you put a big hydrogen station there and you can have all the small trains running around on hydrogen. And that's also a good business model, but this station will probably uh, never be connected to, to anything else or just to very local customers. So it may remain a completely decentralized model. Um, so we strongly believe that both models will coexist, will exist at the same time in different places, but we, uh, as far as Europe is concerned and the main industrial hubs are concerned, we strongly believe they will be interconnected and interconnected with storages. Thanks, Didier. Cosma, you wanted to come in on that policy point? Sorry, Dario. Yes, I uh, basically what Didier said is uh, absolutely in line with our experience. The only thing that I would add is that the uh, incentive systems that have been rolled out so far are mostly focused also on capex while there is a need probably right now for incentives that are also targeting opex to remove uncertainty on the consumer side great so we've got a, a few minutes uh, left i wanted to take a chance to take some of the sort of shorter snappier uh, questions from the audience one we've we've got here um, in the chat is just about you know what, what electricity price um, would, would sustain a break even between green hydrogen and, and the gray hydrogen it's trying to to displace. Um, let, let's put that in a in a European context because obviously um, these things um, differ from from region to region. Uh, anyone who wants to sort of discuss that a little bit and maybe put it in light of the current uh, price conditions. Well, um, please, uh, Helen, go, go okay. ahead. I, I, I would say that the, the viability, the economical viability for green hydrogen, uh, in my opinion, is going to depend also on the application. Uh, nowadays in Spain, uh, our customers are asking us for reaching, to, with the help of the fundings, with the help of the incentives, with the help of the innovation, with the help of the scale, with the help of whatever, the capability to go to 1.5 euros per kilo, two euros per kilo, if the application of the green hydrogen is driven by the industrial need at scale because of thermal reasons. The substitution of the existing natural gas. It is true that the price of the natural gas is, is, it is not a, it is not like this, but it is true that the gray hydrogen uh, is the, the competition there in, in, terms, of, in terms of price. Uh, in the mobility applications, in the mobility sector, the, um, the business case is different. Uh, our customers, uh, transport fleets, they, are, um, they have the need to make few investments in their capex in order to get the appropriate infrastructure to use the green hydrogen. Uh, for the heavy fleets, for the domestic fleets, this is the, this is the case, but they are able to pay a bit more than, than 1.5 euros per kilo for the green hydrogen. They are going to three, four euros per kilo. So, so what I want to say with that is that the perception of the capability to decrease the cost of the green hydrogen and the a origin of the green hydrogen that is the green electricity price that is as Luke was saying at the beginning of the panel driven the uh, the major part of the influence on the final price of the green hydrogen the reality is that it is depending on the application and the capability and the perception of the customer that is able to pay for something that is decarbonizing the, the, the themselves so the the perception that they have on the art sense of urgency of doing that kind of energy transition is helping on the negotiation of the final price. And it is true that the, the green electricity is uh, having in Europe today a very specific casuistic in terms of price 
due to the geopolitic situation of the natural gas. So, so the situation is not stable today, and it is probably uh, helping the energy transition through these kind of technologies as the green hydrogen, in my opinion. Thanks a lot. Uh, you, except if anyone wanted to, to, to add to that, there was another one that maybe we can touch on very briefly. We've, we've talked a lot about uh, Europe and, and you're producing green hydrogen here for, for local applications. Some um, strategies in the European context talk about imports from further afield, for example, the, the German uh, hydrogen strategy of the government, you know, talks about extra uh, EU imports, has a partnership with Morocco. We, we have someone in the audience that asked, you know, what, what's the panel's view on shipping over long distances by, by boat and essentially producing hydrogen in great quantities uh, in, in the places where there is the best natural resources. Luke, I know when we talked um, before, you, you, you had a, a view on that. Yeah, indeed. So, so we believe, let us say, if you talk on, first of all, geopolitical aspect, I'm not so very sure about if the countries where we talk about target countries in North Africa are from a geopolitical perspective, a better case than where we get today or from, from those countries. I, I, I doubt very strong about this, that you make any progress on that one. The other thing is that they say, especially if you look to countries like Morocco, Tunis and Algiers, which are potential target countries to make on a big scale green hydrogen, those countries also have still a certain considerable level of the electrification for the population. So until that is solved, and if you would be, let us say, big, start to make big solar PV plants there and make green hydrogen about these and take the hydrogen to our countries, what is the difference versus the colonization, which you have done 100, 150 years ago as European countries? So therefore, we believe that is a kind of decolonization, a kind of colonization, sorry, colonization 2.0. We believe, let us say, from a geopolitical point of view and also from an, uh, a kind of uh, independency, et cetera, from Europe on external countries, is a much better deal to go for offshore hydrogen production. There is a massive uh, potential still there. If you look to around uh, UK, the huge potential. If you look to Netherlands, yeah, which has about 60 gigawatt of, of, of potential to, be in, to build wind farms in the North Sea, much more than the country needs. I think uh, Europe should be first exploiting this potential. Let's let we have two minutes left. Let's let's quickly yeah. give a, a, a counter view perhaps before we close. Wow. If I may, um, I'm not sure the UK is a better geopolitical risk than Morocco. Uh, second, yes, we don't want to colonize anybody. So that's why in any country we start by satisfying local needs. But then if your local industrial need is for 50 megawatts and you build 100 megawatts then you can export 50 and because these countries also need foreign currencies that's also helpful um, in terms of geopolitical risk well the difference is that sun is well spread over many countries that have no hydrocarbon resources so if you split your eggs between morocco Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Mauritania, the chances that they will all go wrong at the same time are low. And in any case, you can still uh, produce a lot inside Europe, but um, export, uh, importing some of your needs is not in itself a geopolitical risk. The question is not to be over dependent on one country at any given point in time. So in a nutshell, we believe that because some of the neighboring countries, and it may be UK, it may be Morocco, Tunisia, and so on, have cheap power, which as uh, Luke told us, is the most important point to get cheap hydrogen. Um, and because they can export to Europe by pipe, which is the cheapest way to transport hydrogen, then they will take some role in the supply of Europe. Will this role be dominant? Probably not. 
Each of them will supply only a relatively small part of the European market. But we don't see why we should exclude this possibility if it gives access to competitive hydrogen for the European industry. Thanks for that, uh, Didier. Yeah, I think that was a nice way to complete um, the picture and, and views on these last questions. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you on, on the panel for the time you, you've taken it. It was a, a long and, and pretty complete discussion. Thank you to uh, Marie for, for hosting us. And, and most importantly, uh, thanks for everyone for, for tuning in um, and, and joining the, the conversation today and for the q and I think, I think we're going to get off to another busy year for, for hydrogen and, and many more after that. Right, thank excellent. You. And yes, I want to thank you again for Dario, Mr. Dieter, uh, Mr. Cosmo Valen, Luke, and Sarin for taking the time today and for this wonderful, wonderful discussion. Uh, I think we can go on for much, much longer, but I'm afraid we have to come to an end in case someone may miss his uh, or her next meeting. It was truly great talking to you all and learning from you all today. And of course, a big thank you to our listeners who didn't shy away from an hour spent in front of a screen. It was great to meet you all virtually and hopefully we can meet in person next time again. As we come to an end, I wish every one of you a lovely day and please take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.